Magandang umaga, hapon at gabi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers from all over the world. Happy World Indigenous Peoples Month to our IP brothers and sisters. Welcome to the first installment of Tracing Our Roots, a webinar series on Filipino pre-colonial ancestors brought to you by the Department of Foreign Affairs, Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy in partnership with the National Quincentennial Commission. It is very timely that we are having this lecture series because not only are we honoring our IP brothers and sisters this month, but we are also observing 2021 as the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors. Through this webinar series, we will not only take a step back into the past, but we will also discover insights on our history that are unknown to most of us. We are fortunate to have esteemed academics in the area of Philippine history and prehistory to join us in this webinar series. For five consecutive weeks, we shall hear different narratives from diverse perspectives and learn more of the unexplored side of pre-colonial history. Before we begin, we would like to inform everyone that we highly encourage you to share your thoughts and ask questions to our speaker through the comments section. Our technical team will collate them to be asked during the question and answer session after the presentation. Our speaker today is an assistant professorial lecturer at the De La Salle University Manila Department of History and a senior lecturer at the University of the Philippines Diliman Department of Broadcast Communication. He holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in history and is a candidate for a doctorate degree in anthropology at UP Diliman. A very active historian, scholar, and academic, he is the co-author of several books on Andres Bonifacio, one of our country's national heroes, and also a familiar face and voice on our screens as he is often invited to speak on his area of expertise through lectures, webinars, social media, and on televisions, it's show time. He is also a columnist for the Manila Times in Abante. Here to share important information about our predecessors in his talk, our ancestors in us, Please welcome Mr. Michael Charleston Chua, or more commonly known as Mr. Shao Chua. Historic day to everyone. Makasaysayang araw po sa ating lahat. Uh, thank you so much. It is an honor to be introduced by Assistant Secretary Eduardo Menez of the Department of Foreign Affairs. It is truly an honor to be able to be invited to talk to you, my fellow Filipinos, not just here in the Philippines, but uh, to our kababayans around the world. It is my honor to serve you today. I will now share my screen. We will talk about our ancestors in us. This is a, uh, the very first lecture in a series on Filipino pre-colonial ancestors called Tracing Our Roots. Uh, other speakers in the next few uh, weeks would be uh, Dr. Ambeto Campo, Dr. Feliz Noel Rodriguez, Dr. Ariel Lopez, and Mr. Ian Christopher Alfonso. And I'm honored to be uh, a, a, a speaker with them in this uh, series. I have a YouTube channel, and if you want more webinars and uh, videos about history, please subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel, Shao Chua. Follow me on my social media accounts. And I have a website of readings and other materials that you can use, especially for our teachers there who teach Philippine history, shaochuan.net, mangkanishao.wordpress.com. What is the Filipino? Who is the Filipino? It's a very difficult question to answer because 
how can you how can you put into a box uh, a country with about 180 languages and 100, 180 cultures? We have a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-faith people. How do we become a nation in this kind of diversity? What are we going to be our, what, what is it that is going to be our you, you, uh, common ground of nation? This year is 2021. We're commemorating the 500 years of the events of 1521, the victory at Mactan and other related events. Although this is about the circumnavigation also of the world, which is an achievement of mankind, this is not a celebration of colonialism. 2021, our quincentennial commemorations, this is a celebration of our ancestors. And that is why 2021 is also designated by our government, by the Republic of the Philippines as the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors. Maybe in looking at our ancestors, we would see our commonalities. Maybe in looking at our ancestors, we can see our point of nationhood, the point of it all. But what if our idea of our ancestors is skewed by years of histories written by foreigners? where they talked about Filipinos as backward, primitive. They said that we had no elaborate political organization. Our, our, our colonizers wrote our history for many, many years. And because of that, we have a different view of ourselves. We think of ourselves as not so good, we think of our ancestors as stupid, primitive, and backward. This is what we would like to clarify in this webinar today. But where do we begin? If you want to know more about our culture, our ancestors, maybe after the pandemic, if you would come back to the Philippines, I hope that you could visit our National Museum. And in one of the buildings, there is, a muse there is a museum there called National Museum of Anthropology. And there you will see a number of jars. You know, our ancestors used to bury their dead on burial jars like this one, which also reflected their faith, their beliefs, their representations of their ancestors. And one of the jars that could be found in the National Museum is a jar called Manunggul Jar. It is, it is called as such because it was found in uh, Manunggul Cave in Rizal, Palawan, along with other archaeological treasures, including the Tabon Cave Woman. And in the Manunggul Jar, you will see the, the, the design of the Manunggul Jar. There's a boat with two ancestors or with two representations of our ancestors. So if we're going to look at this jar, why is it that there is a boat? Why is it that there are souls aboard the boat? So we're going to look at this and we will see how this is all related to our identity and to who we are as a people. Let's go to the boat first. Despite the fact that uh, new discoveries are showing us that 65,000 years ago, these islands are already inhabited by what we call the Homo Luzonensis. Our real ancestors are actually the Austronesians who arrived here about 4,000 before Christ, 6,000 years ago. And there are many theories about how they arrived here. One theory says, according to uh, Bill Solheim, that uh, 
from the, uh, a place called Nusantara, which is in the Cebu Celeb, uh, in, in the Sulu Celebes area, Sulu and Celebes area, we scattered around Southeast Asia to trade intermarriages and migration. The other theory says from Peter Bellwood that the Austronesians actually came from Taiwan, south of China. But there's one thing that binds these two theories. One is that we developed a boat, the outrigger canoe, which made possible the spread of the Austronesian peoples from our area, the Philippines, to other parts of Southeast Asia, to Melanesia, Guam included, the Marianas, up to Polynesia, Hawaii, New Zealand, up to Easter Island in South America, and Madagascar in South Africa. This is the Austronesian world. It used to be called the Malay world. So when we talk about Filipinos as Malays, this is not because we believe that we are Malaysians. No, Malaysia is a new entity. But we're talking about the race of the Filipinos. We belong to a bigger world, which is the Austronesian world. And this, the evidence that we are all Austronesians are vast, including common cognate words with very similar meanings to each other. Artifacts like this linglingo, I'm, I'm actually wearing one. The linglingo is an earring made of jade from Taiwan. The same design is seen in other parts of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Sabah, Borneo, the Philippines, even New Zealand, which shows us that the, the truth about the connections, our connections with each other. So if we see our country having many, many languages and many, many cultures diversified, just remember, that all of this came from our ancestors, the Austronesians. And we are actually connected with our Southeast Asian brothers and sisters and the larger Pacific world. Now, going back to the boat, it brings me to the point that the Austronesians, having invented the outrigger canoe, had what we call a maritime culture. This maritime culture is hailed even by experts today that the shipbuilding skills and navigational insights of Indians, Filipinos, and Javanese and Arabs were essential to Europe's age of discovery. What does this mean? Before the Europeans were able to conquer lands because of their skills in navigation, we were the first masters of the seas in this part of the world. The evidence, of course, is this um, boat, uh, fragments of uh, wood of uh, an old boat that was found in Butuan, and it was dated around uh, 1,700 years ago, 300 AD. Okay? And the technology that they used in making these boats, they did not use nails. They used the wooden pegs to put the boat together. That's how good they were. And uh, they found other boats in, Butua, in the Butuan area. That's why you see Butuan is the cradle of Filipino civilization. The outriggers make sure that the boat stays stable. In the, on, on the windy seas. We call these boats Balangay. And eventually, Balangay will be, the boat will be associated with how we call our communities during the time of colonization. And eventually, even today, we call the, the communities in the Philippines Barangay, the barrios, the counties, we call them Barangay. And we also had other boats like Parao, and if you're going to look at Moana, the Disney uh, film that was recently shown, it is actually a homage to our Austronesian ancestors, the boat people. 
There are also warships like Caracoa because, you know, the Filipinos have a warrior culture before the coming of the Spaniards. We will talk about that later. In our navigation, we also use the stars. We also use the heavens. We read them even before constellation was introduced to us by the Europeans. We had our own constellation. We see our culture on the stars. When Dante Ambrosio, the ethno-astronomer, the late ethno-astronomer and historian said that when we look into the mountains, so we look up to the star, to, uh, when we look up to the heavens, we just do not see stars. We also see our culture. We also see our faith. We also see our lifestyle. And so this Balatic, for example, this is a, a trap for the wild boar, is actually our name for the Orion or Orion's Belt constellation. So the stars are guiding us and we have our references based on our culture. Also, this fish trap called the Bubu is also what we call Big Deeper. We also had our North Star. We, we, we know that the North Star doesn't move and it will always be our guide. And so because of this elaborate maritime culture, you see that we were able to build communities and connections of different communities around the islands and even in the larger Southeast Asian area. This copper plate that was found in Lumban River in Laguna, it is called the Laguna Copper Plate Inscription, tells us of the connections and diplomacy that was happening around 900 AD. Huh? 900 AD to the kingdoms of Tondo, Ulilan Kasumuran, or the mountainous areas of Laguna. Ulilan is actually the lake. Binuangan, which is Paracale, the gold mines of Paracale in Bicol. Dewata, which is most likely Butuan and Medang, which is in present-day Indonesia. So this ancient document tells us that the maritime culture was able to connect us and that our islands, the archipelago, we were not separated because we were islands. It's actually easier at that time. We had no roads. It's the Spaniards who introduced the road systems. But it was easier for us to travel by the sea. And that's why eventually we we were uh, in this area was called Tagalog because the people here came from the Alog, huh? the river delta and the seashore. Alog is the river delta and the seashore, according to a historian, Lars Raymond Dubaldo. And that's why the Tagalogs, these are the Tagalogs from an old document from 1593 called the Boxer Codex. And remember that our ancestors had the polity. We had an organized, we had organized governments. We had alliances that were able to be built through the Sandugo or the blood compact of the Datus. These, uh, the picture of this, this, this picture shows uh, the, the sultans of uh, Mindanao in the 20th century, early 20th century. These are the heirs of our ancestors and their kind of government. And because of that, we were able to be, become part of the Southeast Asian trade route to China. And that is why you, you're going to see that. Why are our ancestors, why did they welcome? Why they were welcoming? Why are we hospitable? It is because even before the coming of the Spaniards, we are very much attuned or, or we are very much uh, welcoming already to our visitors because they are our trading partners. Now we go to the other figure. Aside from the boat, you see the soul. And this can be explained through a belief by our ancestors that when we die, our kalulua, our kalulua, our soul travels because we have a maritime culture our consciousness tells us that our faith or our consciousness tell, tells us that in our faith, go, when we go to the afterlife, when we die, we will ride a boat going to the afterlife. Huh? Our soul goes 
to the afterlife with a boat. That's why if you're going to look at this commonality, remember we have many cultures around the country, but it's very common to see in different parts of the country that the coffins that are used to bury our ancestors after the burial jars you know, are boat coffins. So they, they found boat coffins in Butuan, boat coffins in Cagayan de Oro, in Masbate, and also in the Cordillera. So if you're going to look at the culture of our uh, ethno-linguistic groups, our indigenous peoples in which we celebrate their day today, you will see the various patterns of culture that we have that makes us one people, despite our diversity. Okay? And even when some of our ancestors learned how to bury their dead, you see that there were uh, the, the design of their graves are shaped like boats, especially in Batanes. So you see the boat, the, the, the bangka and the bangkai connection, because the bangkai is, is uh, buried in uh, with the bangka. That's why if you look closer, or when you look closer, you will realize that in the Manungul jar. There are actually not, not, not one, not two souls, but actually three souls. Why? Because there are three faces in the Manungul jar. The soul, the abai, or the, uh, the, the, the companion of the soul, and the boat. The boat itself has a soul because we believe that when our ancestors die, we go back to nature. We go back to the trees, we go back to the forest, we go back to the rivers, to the rocks. We go back to take care of the people who are left behind. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, you will see that our ancestors respected cult, respected the, the environment, respected Mother Nature. When they have to build a house and have to cut trees, they have to have a ritual to to uh, uh, ask permission from Mother Nature for the uh, cutting of the trees. And it has to be uh, done in a good with a good purpose. And so you see there that early Filipinos are makakalikas. All right? And so now we go to, we elaborate. What is the belief in the Kaluluwa? It's actually, although Oh, by the way, before that, if you're going to see the design in the Manungul jar, you see the boat, and then there's a there's a, a soul riding a boat. See, in, when I visited a Muslim graveyard in uh, in uh, uh, Sambuanga del Sur, at, yeah, Sambuanga del Sur, I or Sambuanga City, Sambuanga City. I'm sorry, Sambuanga City. I saw these, uh, what we call sunduks or grave markers. It's, this is where you see that you have, you know, that kind of representation in Palawan through the Manungul jar. You also see this also in uh, Zamboanga and in Sulu as well. Uh, you see both coffins or both graves with the representation of a person riding it. Okay. So uh, there are also artifacts from our uh, uh, from from uh, uh, in Paris from the Musée de Quai, Quai Branly, uh, the sunduks or the person riding a boat, the representation of our soul going to the afterlife, even in Muslim Philippines. So this is where you see that despite the fact that the the Mindanao was Islamized uh, or parts of Mindanao were Islamized, you can still see our Austronesian roots there. One representation of the ancestor or the what we call the Anito, the soul of the ancestor, which is called an Anito, which is very similar to uh, the Manungul jar representation here, as you can see. Right? The person is buried like this uh, in the fetal position. Right? You came forth to the world like this, you will come back to the world like this. You will see that the bulol 
representation of the Anito in northern Philippines, Cordillera, is actually very similar to the Rapa Nui, or what we call the Moais, or sorry, not Rapa Nui, the Moais in Rapa Nui, or Easter Island. So the Moais, if you're going to look at them, you know, they, they look like big heads, but actually, they're actually buried bulls on the ground. You see? Uh, and that's why you will see that these, these, these Moais were not built by aliens. They were built by our Austronesians. Okay? So, this is where you see a great similarity. And I said, why uh, the fetal position? Because that is how they buried the dead before. And what they do with the dead is that they will wipe, they, they, will, they will smoke the dead, and they're going to wipe the dead so that the last uh, juices of the dead will go to your panyo or to your handkerchief or to your cloth, and that you can also... Um, you can also wipe it to yourself so that the power of the dead person goes to you. The gahum, the power, the strength of the person goes to you as well. And so this is the belief of our ancestors, which is very much reflected even today to our pra religious practices. Now, when Reina Juana in 1521 received the Santo Nino, or even some, uh, some uh, translation of the Pigafetta account said, asked for the Santo Nino, we probably saw it as an anito. And that's why when we accepted the fate of our colonizers, uh, we saw that this is just a continuation of our old culture. And so that's why we continue to wipe uh, the santos with our handkerchiefs and with our towels to get power from them, to get healing from them. And this is what, where, where, where you see that their ancestors, their culture did not die. When the Spaniards came and colonized us, our culture is enduring. Our culture is very much flexible. Now, let's elaborate on this belief in the soul. Our ancestors believe that a person has two parts. The panlabas, this is the body, what you see in the outside, and the panloob, what's inside of you. And the panloob has two life forces, kaluluwa, or the soul, and ginhawa. Let's go first to ginhawa. Ginhawa is the life force in the liver that animates our well-being. When you are healthy, according to Sayo Salasa, who collected the various definitions of ginhawa, when you are healthy, when you can breathe well, when you can, um, when you have peace of mind, when you are comfortable, when you can eat, when you can, you know, uh, that's why when you go to the comfort room, that's also ginhawa. Ginhawa, pagyaman, is not necessarily what Filipinos want. You can be mayaman or rich, but not maginhawa. But what Filipinos really want is kaginhawa. The total well-being of a person. And the total well-being, according to Filipino psychology or psikolohiyan Filipino, as studied by people like Salazar, Cobar, and Virgilio Enriquez, is animated or will only work, the ginhawa will only work if the kaluluwa, which is in the mind, no, no, the brain, in the brain of a person, will also work. And basically, how does it work? The kaluluwa should be good. Matuwid na kaluluwa. Righteous soul. Because if the kaluluwa is not good, the, the kaluluwa is halang. You see, halang ang kaluluwa. And you know, just move the kaluluwa. Uh, I mean, if the kaluluwa moved out of its supposed alignment, that will make a child sick. That's why nausog ang kaluluwa. That would make a person uh, not feel well. And so, uh, what I'm saying here is this. Our ancient Filipinos should keep their kaluluwa matuwid. The bad kaluluwa should not come into the body. And so you have to protect the body with anting-anting. 
the gold of our ancestors. That's why they were wearing elaborate gold. How do you say that our ancestors are stupid when they can actually create these kinds of materials? And this is not just for jewelry. There is a spiritual component to this. To protect their kaluluwa from being bad and to maintain matuwid na kaluluwa, which brings kaginhawaan. Eventually, Andres Bonifacio would equate kaginhawaan with kalayaan. Not just political freedoms, but kaginhawaan. So there, there is no kalayaan or freedom, real freedom, if there is no well-being or kaginhawaan. And there is no kaginhawaan without mabuting kaluluwa. So what we're talking about here is the values of our ancestors. What did they value? That we can still learn from them after all these years. How do you show kabutihang loob? How do you show your matuwid na kaluluwa? You show this through kapatiran. Kapatiran is ritualized through the sandugo or the blood compact, which makes people magkapatid. And they are supposed to love each other as magkapatid. Datu, datus have sandugo so that they can unite the various communities into the bayan. And so, if you're going to look at it, the basis of the formation of the bayan is kapatiran, sandugo. You are one blood, you are magkapatid, you are brothers and sisters, and you're ought to love each other like that. So, love and kapatiran is the basis of the formation of the community. And Andres Bonifacio thought about that. And it became the basis, basis of founding the Katipunan and eventually the founding of the Haring Bayan, which is his concept of the nation. All of these values are exemplified in one person, and that person is the Bagani. The Bagani is the old warrior. But Bagani also goes beyond that because Bagani is, very, is connected to the word Bayani, and both words actually came from the Austronesian word Wani. Bagani means kawalang takot and it, it's connected with Bayani or our, it's, 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 it's hero. It's our, our concept of heroism in the Philippines. But this concept, Bagani and Bayani, came from the word Wani. And Wani is a Japanese, Javanese, not Japanese, Javanese from Indonesia. Javanese word which means helping someone based on your capacity and your talents, and through these talents, you're also fixing pagsasaayos the community. This is a very good concept. This is the concept of Filipino heroism. When you use your talents, your skills, to, 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 to help the community, to fix the problems of the community, Wani means pagtulong at malasakit. To help and to care for someone, especially when they are in need. Huh? Now, in Manobo, Bahani, which is their warrior, their bagani, is the gentle and harsh knight of the village, according to Ian Senyo Manuel, whose job is to right wrongs or perform revenge on account of another party after the performance of a ritual act. He may perform his duties either alone or with select companions under his command and responsibility. He does not serve, however, under any particular official nor villager. His services are available to any citizen, lowly or high, poor or rich, bloodkin or not. He cannot refuse to perform his office if approached. It's different from the concept of heroism from the West, which came from the Greeks, which, uh, which emphasizes on the strength of a person, that the person is extraordinarily strong or extraordinarily talented, like the gods of Greece. There's a certain individualism in the concept, in the Western concept of heroism, that the hero has a persona. But the Bayani in the Philippines focuses on the welfare of his group 
or her group. And he is with the people, not above the people, not apart from the people, but with the people. So basically, if you're going to look at it, in simple terms, according to the studies of Seyus Salazar, the Bayani in the whole country is someone who helps the community with, without expecting anything in return. He might be paid for services like you know all our workers should be, but he doesn't get rich in that. The Bagani or the Bayani is being, shall we say, you know, uh, you know Wang Un. She's the very last one to, she's the very last tattoo artist to put tattoos on real warriors of the Kalinga in northern Philippines. And why is she putting tattoos on the warriors? Because every time a warrior is able to gain victory, and is able to kill justly the enemies of his people, then he gets a patek or a tattoo. Patek, patek in different parts of the country, this is what it is called. That's why a skilled warrior with many batek is called batekan. And today, we call a person who is skilled as batekan. This is what our ancestor have shown Lapu-Lapu is our representative. Lapu-Lapu is the uh, leader of the people of the island of Mactan who was able to vanquish Magellan when he was already meddling in the affairs, political affairs of the people in the island of Cebu. He used his skill or they, the people of Mactan, together with Lapu-Lapu, used their skills they're being Batikan and become victorious against foreign intervention. So, when we talk about the quincentennial theme, that is what we call victory of our ancestors. The victory at Mactan. We, we commemorate that. But exemplified in the Bagani, Exemplified in the Bagani, and by the way, the quincentennial song is called Bagani. Please check that out. Exemplified in the Bagani is also the concept of pakikipagkapwa tao. The Bagani helps the people because he is nakikipagkapwa tao. And what is pakikipagkapwa? It stems from the word kapwa. And kapwa doesn't have any English equivalent. Because kapwa is if roughly translated means you see yourself in the other person. So if you see yourself in the other person, you will do to, to that person what it, you expect others to do, uh, that you want to do uh, to, for them to do to you. So this pakikipagkapwa tao for the people in need, you know, it's surprising that a lot of people it surprises a lot of people because not a lot of people know this because uh, we only focus on the Battle of Mactan. We only focus on the victory of Lapu-Lapu in the story of 1521. But before that, before that happened, the answers, the, 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 our colon, uh, the, the not the colonizers, the, the Spaniards who came here, Magellan, they did not come in glory. They did not come as, you know, superhuman people. If you look at the story of Magellan, they actually came here destitute. They came in here hungry. They were dying with lots of diseases. They've been in the sea for 90 days without good food and water. They were already hungry. When our ancestors saw them as they landed in Samar on March 1521, and our ancestors, the Baganis, they did not understand each other. But they returned to Magellan and gave them food. And brought them coconut water so that they could be strong again. Without this act of humanity to the needy, we will not be talking 
of any first circumnavigation of the world which became the achievement of science and humankind. That is why our theme is victory and humanity. This humanity doesn't you know, choose any race, any color of skin. When, our, when, 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 the, when, when the Spaniards came, our ancestors gave them food. Also because we knew how to train. We know how to make friends. And we welcome everyone when they come in peace. And this pakikipagkapwa tao, we also showed to the people in need during World War II. There are about 1,300 a Jews that we welcomed here in our country to President Manuel Quezon. And they were saved from the Holocaust, from the horrible Holocaust that happened in the 1940s. When the, when the communists won in China in 1949, the anti-communist white Russian community numbering about 5,500 were saved by the Filipinos through President Elpidio Quirino. And they were placed, incidentally, in Giwan Eastern Samar, where Magellan also tasted Filipino humanity from our ancestors. And they were saved from, definite, uh, from, from, from real danger because of that. And also the boat people from Vietnam. We were able to take care of them, thousands of them, in various parts of the country, especially in Palawan and in Matahan. And when we worship, when we worship, we also show our pakikipagkapwa. Why? Because our, our, our thanksgiving for a good harvest is brought out of thanksgiving to the Anitos to the Batala, to the Batala, to the one God for giving us good harvest. And so this is being continued today in the way we feast. We share food to each other. Some people say the fiesta is a Spanish trait and we do not want it because it makes people utangeros. People, people borrow money just to share food. But you know, sharing food is actually the way Filipinos do it even before the Spaniards came. When they want to thank the Anitos, they share food to each other. We share food to our uh, visitors when they come here. We had fiesta. And we share food to, our, to people even if we do not know them. And the kapatiran of the Filipinos, Filipino revolutionaries, the Katipunan, who initiated the Philippine Revolution and the birth of the Filipino nation, in the very first cry of the revolution, what did, what did Tandang Soran do? She fed a thousand Katipuneros. The revolution actually started in feasting. And when the last Spaniards surrendered to the Filipino forces in Baler, Aurora, one year after the actual surrender of the Spaniards to the Americans, when they came out of the Church of Baler, the Spaniards felt that maybe they will be harmed. But no, the Filipino forces, when they surrendered, when they came out of the church, hugged them, welcomed them, and shouted, Amigos, amigos, we are your friends, and brought them back to safety. And they were able to go back to Spain, and they were called our friends, because of their bravery. The Spaniards showed their bravery in Baler in 1899. The Filipinos showed our pakikipagkapwa tao, our humanity. And that made us victorious. We ended 300 years of Spanish colonialism. We Filipinos. Our revolution became victorious. And in our revolutions, we just do not show our faith. We also show our humanity. And we have shown that in the People Power Revolution of 1896, when we gave food to people, to the, to the soldiers, and to the soldiers who are not part of the revolution or supposed to, you know, quell the revolution. We did not harm them. We gave them flowers. 
we hugged them and we told them, why are we killing it? Why will we kill each other? We are all Filipinos. Jose Misal once said and predicted with the new men that will spring from her bosom and the remembrance of the past. She will perhaps enter openly the wide road of progress and all will work jointly to strengthen the mother country at home as well as abroad. With the same enthusiasm with which a young man returns to cultivate his father's farmland, so long devastated and abandoned due to the negligence of those that alienated it, perhaps the people will revive their maritime and commercial activities and free once more like the bird that leaves his cage, like the flower that returns to the open air. They will discover their good old qualities which we are losing little by little and again become lovers of peace, gay, lively, smiling, hospitable, and fearless. Paano ba natin maaabot ang kaginawahan? How will we reach kaginawahan of the bayan? Simple. According to Rizal, with us, the new men that sprang from her bosom, and if we remember the past, if we remember our ancestors, and we go back to our maritime and commercial activities, and we will help the country from here at home as well as those abroad, we will become free once more. We will recover our good old qualities, and we will be maginhawa. For some of you, for many of you, this webinar is just the beginning of your discovery, of your looking back, and remembrance of the past, and remembrance of those who came before us, in order for you to be able to contribute to that kaginawa. And so, ladies and gentlemen, isn't it that this is what a lot of you are already doing collectively as overseas Filipino workers, as migrant Filipinos around the world, by helping the economy here in the Philippines to be afloat because of what you do to your families, your collective heroism had saved the country. And this is what a lot of us continue to do with the community pantries, which just became famous because of the pandemic, but has been done all around the country for many, many years where people help each other in times of need, calamities, and all of that. And with this kind of attitude, with this kind of spirit that we have, the spirit of pakikipagkapwa tao, with our victorious ancestors, their spirit is also with us. We are going to prevail. We are going to help our frontliners. We are going to pray for them. We are going to support them. And all of us will be able to do our part and our share. And collectively, we are going to be victorious in our humanity. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when I look at this jar, the Manungul jar, I just do not see a burial jar. I see the victory and humanity within us. We see ourselves. We see our identity. That jar. In that jar, we see ourselves. Marami pong salamat at makasaysayang araw sa ating na. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Ms. Professor Chua, for that wonderful and inspiring discussion of our pre-colonial ancestors' culture. And of course, tracing all these uh, admirable traits from, uh, from them to where we are today. So now we will proceed to the question answer portion of the program. Um, we are happy to have received some questions from the audience. Uh, and it, you can still do that by uh, typing in the comments box 
and let me begin with a number of them. Um, we have a question here from uh, Ms. Rona Aves. Uh, can you elaborate on how our ancestors built connections with other nationalities? How did they view them and interact with these other nationalities? In my lecture, I touched, but not really uh, um, elaborate on uh, that the hospitality of the Filipinos. And it is because they are actually very much adept with trade. They've been trading with our, uh, with our neighbors in Southeast Asia for a thousand, for a thousand years already. And so uh, what we can see is that, uh, you know, they, uh, some of them knew how to speak the lingua franca which was Malay at that time, Bahasa Malay. Uh, uh, that's why if you're going to look at the Pigafetta account, uh, Enrique de Malaca, who was Malay, was able to understand the, the, the datus, only the datus, not the common people <laughs> during that time, only the datus, only the datus. So uh, there's so much adept that they, they, some of the elites at the time, the datus, the they were able to learn the language of, of the, the common language of trade at that time. And uh, I believe that the, although the, you know, the problem with the this, this story of our ancestors is that we do not have so much accounts from their perspective. A lot of the things that we know came from uh, the Spaniards, but they were able to interpret them in our own perspective. And because we saw our ancestors as being adept with trade, I believe that they, uh, they have very good relations with the, the Chinese, for example. Now, that's why we have the confusion on the West Philippine Sea, because uh, that was actually common uh, fishing, uh, common, common trade route during the time of our ancestors. Uh, people use that uh, sea, sea lay to be able to trade. So what, what, what is probably, shall we say, um, what could be surmised is that if there were foreigners, for example, who were able to not fulfill their obligation in trade, I think that is where the warrior people will, uh, uh, will, will, will be able to decide through war by attacking the, uh, the places who did not pay them or whatever. So there's a sense of justice, you know. I mean, I'm not. Uh, when we talk about the values of our ancestors, we are not really idealizing them. We just want to get any uh, something from them. We want to get their what what was important for them. But you know, there was a time before that they were really harsh. I mean, if 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 you if you cross us, that that is the message of victory and humanity. You see, we Filipinos, we will be humane with you. If you, uh, we will be humane with you if you come in peace. Well, but if you cross us, if you meddle with our affairs, then we are going to fight. And even if it is difficult, if it would be difficult, we are still going to fight. So the victory and humanity theme of the Quincentennial Commemoration, I believe is actually very appropriate in telling our history. Thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Uh, we have another question from uh, Lionel Casimiro. And the question is, what do you think are the four most important values that we inherited from our ancestors? I think you touched on this in your, in your lecture. But uh, just to emphasize, and by the way, uh, values in a sense of the Western sense of values, sometimes it's really Judeo-Christian, you know, it's, it's biased uh, against Judeo-Christian values. That's why I... I think I did not want to call them values. Uh, I want to call them the kalooban ng bayan. Uh, this is the spirit of our people. Uh, so uh, my, my, my take would be, if you're going to look at the lecture, the spirit of our people, as imbibed also by the Katipunan, is kaginhawaan, kaginhawaan, mabuting kalooban or goodness, Kapatiran, or brotherhood and sisterhood. And this is all based upon love. 
Okay? Even the Katipuneros were able to recognize this. You know, they always say in the Cartilla, the first command, one of the first commandments here is to love your fellow man. And that's Bonifacio emphasized that when you love God, you have to love your, your native land. Because loving your native land is love of fellow man. So it, I think Andres Bonifacio and our, and our ancestors did not just teach us how to fight or be magiting or be valiant or be brave. They also taught us how to love. And I think that's the bottom line. That's the greatest spirit of, that we can get from our ancestors. The love, the love with each other, that's also pakikipagkapwa na. Thank you, uh, Professor Chua. Um, well, I, I, uh, I'm conscious of the time. <laughs> so uh, we will send other questions uh, of the audience to you. And then uh, perhaps we could reach out or through your uh, social media posts, uh, they can learn more about this very interesting topic. And as, as I mentioned, uh, Tracing Our Roots is a five uh, episode uh, webinar and uh, next weeks, over the next weeks we'll be having more. Um, so we would like to thank you for this wonderful and enlightening, enlightening morning, uh, afternoon or evening for all of us. And uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, there are different sides of our history that still remain unearthed. And by uncovering each mystery, we discover parts of our identity, our culture, and our humanity. So before we end today's episode, uh, allow me to present this virtual certificate of appreciation uh, to our speaker. And uh, if I may read this certificate, the Department of Foreign Affairs presents this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Charleston Xiao Chua for sharing his invaluable insights and expertise as resource speaker on the first episode of Tracing Our Roots, a webinar series on pre Filipino pre-colonial ancestors held on 2 September 2021 on the official Facebook page and YouTube channel of the DFA, given the second day of September 2021. So we would like to, again, extend our appreciation to Professor Chua for joining us today and sharing his knowledge. Uh, we would like to thank all our viewers and uh, kindly fill up the form, which will be posted on the chat box below to receive your certificates of attendance to today's webinar. We hope to see you again in the second installment of our webinar on 9 September at 2 p.m. this time, where we will have Dr. Ambeth Ocampo speak on rotten beef and stinking fish, Rizal and the writing of Philippine prehistory. So I'm sure that given today's inaugural, very interesting connected uh, lecture, uh, we will continue to enthrall the audiences over the next uh, few episodes. So uh, stay tuned. And thank you very much again, Professor Chua. We will follow you on uh, social media and through your other outlets. I would like to thank uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and you, uh, ASEC uh, Menyes, for this initiative, because this uh, kind of uh, materials are very much needed now because of the online classes. I, I would really, uh, I would like to take this opportunity before we go to, to greet a very special uh, a friend of mine, uh, whom I consider a, a, a family member also, uh, Cham Guevara uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs. She used to be consul in Canada. And I also like to greet uh, my uh, mother, Vilma Briones Chua and the Briones Chua clan, uh, and also uh, my girlfriend, Duela Mai Orozco. And I, I thank Ian Alfonso as well from the National Quincentennial Committee and the people from the NHCP uh, for, and, and the Department of Foreign Affairs for this opportunity given to me. God bless you all. Mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Mabuhay. Maraming salamat ulit.